Right then, driving the new Defender. Quite a big moment, isn't it? Now we are in Namibia. We are gonna be testing this car to its absolute limit over the next three days. But first, I thought you might wanna know what it's like to drive, you know, on an actual road. A shorter three-door Defender 90, starting from around 40 grand, goes on sale a little later, but it's this Pangea Green Defender 110 that's our home for the next three days. A D240 four-cylinder diesel fitted with a full Explorer pack and a few choice extras strapped to the roof. Here we go then. First things first, this car is running on Goodyear Duratec off-road tyres. They're the standard optional off-road tyre and we're running lower pressures than normal. That's because that's the setup we need to tackle the terrain that we're going to find over the next three days. We have managed to find pretty much the only tarmac road in the whole of Namibia. And uh, yeah, there is a bit of delay and squidge in the steering, a bit of extra noise, but honestly, not that much. You could run these tires every day. And while I'm here, there's something I just need to get off my chest nice and early. The camera for a rear view mirror, don't like that. You can flip it between a normal mirror and a screen like that, but it's really hard to adjust your eyes to it. And it looks like everyone is aggressively tailgating you. Seating position. The big news is the new Defender is no longer the ergonomic nightmare that the old one was, where your nose was crushed against the windscreen and your elbow was squashed against the door. Big humans will fit. Also, minted farmers might be part of the target demographic for this car, but it's no longer agricultural. You've got a smooth eight-speed auto gearbox, the two-litre diesel in this one feels remote. You do sense a certain size and weight to the car, but a bit like the Discovery, that's actually a good thing. It rolls down the road with a heft and a confidence. It feels planted. This car doesn't have any sporty pretensions. There's definitely no sport mode down here, and I love that. It's just a big, comfy, high-riding SUV that's ready to go into off-road beast mode at any moment. If you don't want a diesel, there'll be a tax-dodging plug-in hybrid version in about a year, and if you want more performance, you want this. There is a 300 horsepower, two litre turbo petrol also available, but this is the daddy. A straight six with a turbocharger, supercharger, and a mild hybrid system for 400 horsepower. As suspected, the diesel is perfectly fine, and let's face it, is probably the one you're gonna buy, but this is the one you want. That's much more like it. If you're wondering why the hype around a new Defender is quite so feverish, it's because the car it replaces, which ended production in January 2016, can trace its roots all the way back to the original Series 1 Land Rover from 1948. 68 years of constant production, over 2 million produced. A car loved and used properly all around the globe for daily chores and countless expeditions, the Defender is more than just an icon. It's a national treasure and the toughest of acts to follow. Right, back to 2020. Our journey begins in Apuro, in Namibia's extreme northwest corner, before traveling north to the infamous Van Zell Pass, south through the Marium Fluss to wildlife-rich Puros, before exploring the skeleton coast and looping back to where we started, nearly 700 kilometers in total. We'll be traveling in convoy, and I should mention this is a Land Rover organized trip, so the danger is managed, but still very much real. As any expedition veteran will tell you, the key to survival is preparation, which is why back here, I've got all the essentials. A tent, a sleeping bag, a big dustproof bag, which could be quite useful, seeing as we're in the desert, an extremely sporty looking hat, a head torch, essential for those late night loo runs, a towel, if you can call it that, I'm sure that's gonna do the job, a couple of tubes of Pringles, some water, some toilet paper, some tissues, some baby wipes. And before you ask, the fact that my shorts and t-shirt match the car, complete coincidence. Day one and a relatively gentle introduction, 140 kilometers down washed out gravel tracks and rocky paths to our campsite for the night, perched at the top of the pass. But first, a bit of a confession. The truth is, I don't really get off-roading, not as a hobby at least. Why anyone would want to go and spend their weekends trying to get stuck in a puddle. 
But the significance of this car isn't lost on me. We've been waiting decades and decades and decades for a new Defender and now it's finally here. And you have to say, the team that designed this had an unenviable job, didn't they? But they've done a fantastic job on this thing. It references the past, but it also moves things on. The biggest compliment I can pay this car is that when I first saw it, straight away, within seconds, I wanted one. And I still do. So the big question is, why are we out in the middle of nowhere in Africa to drive this thing when we could, you know, just drive it around in the Midlands? Well, it's because the Defender has to be the most rugged, the most capable, whatever you want to call it, car in the world. Buyers from wealthy farmers to the kind of people that are just going to drive it around the middle of London need to know if they're going to put their money down on this thing that it can do this sort of stuff. So these are the type of roads that we're having to deal with today. You can't get too close to the car in front because they're just kicking up this huge rooster tail of dust and it just reduces your visibility to zero. So you've got to keep your distance. In terms of the road surface, well, it's a gravel road, loose surface. You can feel the car just wandering around underneath you. It's quite nice, actually. If I was more childish, I'd be doing some skids at this point. And then all of a sudden, you'll get these things called washouts where a river has run across the road, gouged out a hole, and just created this really steep rut. So you gotta watch out for those because you don't wanna hit them carrying too much speed. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, the road surface can completely change. It becomes corrugated. It's just a series of ripples. It's a serious suspension test. I've actually been to Namibia once before, and I did a four-hour drive in a battered old Toyota Hiace with broken suspension, and it was absolute torture on these type of roads. But as you can see, the Defender just glides over it, deals with it admirably. I'm told that when they were testing this car, they drove it repeatedly at 25 miles an hour into a 200 millimeter high curb. And right now, that's quite reassuring. Still reeling from just how tough the new Defender is, how much punishment it can absorb and keep plugging on unscathed, we arrive at the campsite with just enough time to dip myself in mosquito repellent before dinner. But before all that, a tour of our accessories in a bit more detail. So just before we um, try and get comfy for the night, I thought I'd just show you around the accessories on this car in a little bit more detail. This is the raised air intake, the snorkel if you like. Now, contrary to popular belief, this does not raise the wading height of the Defender to somewhere up here. It's still 900 millimeters, which is roughly my hip height. Not bad at all. The point of this is to raise the air intake out of the sort of dust stream. So when you've got all of that dust and dirt and everything flying down here, you're getting clean air into the engine. Come around the front. This car's fitted with a winch, not part of the Explorer pack, but the ultimate accessory if you're going to be going to places like this. Apparently, this could pull the Defender up a vertical wall. Now, of course, if we come across a vertical cliff face and, I don't know, Freddie Flintoff, I'll be sure to show you how that works. Next up, we have the panniers, these storage boxes on the side. Now, you open it up with this key here. Now, the contents of this box shows us how much faith Land Rover has in us because there's a fire extinguisher. And over here, some dehydrated food. Apparently, this is because rivers can form quite quickly in Namibia. And if we get stuck between two rivers, we'll be stranded for the night. So um, we've made it to the campsite. We won't be needing that today at least. And finally, the really good stuff, the built-in ladder. So you pull that latch, it should, with a bit of effort, come away, fold down, stand back, I'm going up. Onto the Explorer roof rack, which has been fully kitted out with everything you need. Sand ladders, extra petrol, a shovel over here, and a spare tire. And while I'm up here, I bet you're just praying I fall over, aren't you? I'm going to take the best seat in the house for that sunset. I'll tell you what, this is how you want to end the day, isn't it? Day two, 300 kilometers to cover, and there's no gentle start. This is the Van Zell Pass, the fiercest off-road examination in Namibia and we're about to drive over it and plunge 600 meters into the valley below. The steepest parts of this pass are 35 degrees. That's like driving down a black ski run that's covered in boulders in a two and a half ton car. The next 20 kilometers 
are going to take us two and a half hours. Time to deploy some of the Defender's technology. So you can delve into the menus and control everything manually, select the amount of diff lock you want, the amount of slip you want on each wheel, or you can be very undefender and just put the terrain response mode in auto and let the car decide for you what it wants to do. Either way, you can see on the display in the center here what's going on with your diffs and your various angles. What you must do is remember to put the car into low range mode. For that, you put the uh, gear lever in neutral, you hit this button that says low, you get your green icon on the screen and you're away. You must also put the car in its off-road height. Standard cars come on coil springs, of course. This is on air suspension um, that self-levels. It lowers when you need to do stuff like load the boot or can stand up on its tiptoes for more extreme stuff like this. Right, I think we're ready. Off we go. Let the car do the work, Jack. Let the car do the work. So the chassis on the new Defender is called DX7. It's an aluminium monocoque. It does have certain things in common with other aluminium platforms that Land Rover makes, but it's basically 90% all new parts and it's the stiffest body that they've ever made, which when you're driving up and down what basically amounts to sheer cliff faces here, that's very reassuring indeed. There is some pretty smart technology at my fingertips if I can bring myself oh, to take my fingertips off the wheel. You hit this camera symbol down here, hit on-road mode, and you get this incredible 3D view of the car as viewed from the outside. It's called 360 Scout. The idea being like, it's like having a passenger who's got out the car and is scouting the track ahead for you. And it is pure witchcraft. Not entirely sure how it works. Something to do with merging the images from all five cameras around the car and creating this picture you see down here but it's absolutely brilliant. I bet you that'd be really useful on width restrictors, as well as, well, insane mountain passes like this. Also, if we hit off-road mode down here, you've got the invisible bonnet mode. This is even cleverer, I think, because it's taking an image of the road in front of the car, then delaying that image and feeding it to this camera feed here. So you've effectively got the position of your front wheels and an image of what's going on under the car in real time, which is super useful when there's jagged rocks everywhere that could puncture all your tires. It's amazing stuff. If you buy this car, you owe it to the engineers to go and do some of this stuff. You don't have to come to Africa. You can do it in the UK, but you need to see what this car is capable of. It's absolutely phenomenal. And that's what happens when you don't get it right. Anyway, first big test complete. Next, things were about to open up considerably as we entered the Marion Fluce. Just look at the scale of this place. It's absolutely stunning. And the surface has changed once again. We're now running on loose sand. We're following these tracks, which I'm told are laid down mainly by Toyotas. Most of the cars around here are Toyota pickups, which has a slightly narrower track than this Defender. And what that means is that it has a tendency to make the car weave left and right in a slightly disconcerting manner, but I'm told it's completely normal, so I'm going to ignore it for now. We've got some distance to cover today, so it's the perfect time to kick back and reflect on the fact that the Defender really is a very, very good road trip car. It's not luxury in the sense of leather and knurled metal switches like you get in a Bentley. The luxury here is space because you've got all this storage space, big storage bins in the doors, and you've got this beam that runs right across the middle of the dash, magnesium alloy beam. You do get one of those in a Range Rover, except it's covered up. Here they've just exposed it in the Defender and created this really, really useful shelf for all your road trip crap, the dicky seat. So you've basically got the option of having a normal centre console, or you can have this third seat in the middle. So when it's folded down like this, you've got cup holders here, you've got various power outlets behind it, you've got somewhere to put your phone back here. But then, when you need to give someone extra a lift, you just flip it up like this. And there we go, three seats in the front. Okay, we've got some kilometers to kill, so I've got a side mission, animal spotting. I'm told there's elephant, giraffe, rhino, lions, and baboons around here. I can't be certain we'll see them, and clearly I'm no Attenborough, but eyes peeled, 
full safari mode engaged. Look, 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 look! James, get the camera out, look! Giraffe! Oh man! I'm not joking, it's an actual giraffe. I was semi-joking when I said we we're gonna see some animals. Look at it. Still buzzing from our <clears throat> epic close encounter, we arrive at our lodge just before dark, grab a beer and collect my thoughts. All right, that's the end of the day. Back at the um, extremely modest lodge. I thought I'd just download my thoughts because that was a massive day. That was the big one. It all started basically out of our tent, brush our teeth, straight down the Van Zell Pass. Massively steep, a huge test for the car, but it really shrugged it off. The thing about the Defender is it makes you look like an off-road expert when really I'm doing little more than putting it in the right mode and resting my foot on the throttle. It's off-road! It's some good fun actually because Nick Rogers, the chief engineer on the Defender, showed me how to rock a Defender back and forth. You balance two wheels and then you have the other two hanging in the air. Great fun. Felt a little bit like it might be my initiation into the off-road fraternity. One-handed. From there, we headed down into the Marium Fluce, this incredible expanse of sand, really good fun, lots of speed. We could slide the car around a bit there. Felt like proper Africa, big sky, big landscapes, couple of flat tires. That was quite amusing. Luckily, I was on hand to um, wield the uh, wheel nut gun. And then we came across this shop, middle of nowhere. We'd been driving for hundreds of kilometers, hadn't seen another car, and suddenly this souvenir shop pops up out of nowhere. Bracelets, wooden elephants. What an amazing existence. They live and work there in the middle of nowhere. I set myself the task of seeing some animals. Basically, I decided I was on safari, and I thought we'd hit the jackpot when I spotted a giraffe about 600 meters away. We got a shot of it, came around the corner, Boom, an entire herd of giraffes. It was amazing. We just crawled along with them, tried not to disturb them. And the car, completely resilient, totally unstoppable, but also quite a lot of fun. I wouldn't call it nimble, but it certainly has a balance to it. I feel like I'm starting to bond with the car. So much fun, quite a lot to process. So I think on that note, I'm just gonna um, say cheers, sign off, try and get some sleep. Day three, the final leg, and we've saved the best for last. Cruising through and rolling down sand dunes in the endlessly breathtaking Skeleton Coast Park, snuggled up against the Atlantic Ocean. Then inland, bombing up the mostly dry Hurusib riverbed, encountering some more sizable friends along the way, and having pretty much the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Driving the Defender here is a bit like rallying without any of the precision or skill. Some with a little less skill than others. Shouldn't have said that. I think I might be a little bit stuck. No, stop, 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 go back. Okay, so I want to show you how this new Wade sensing mode works. You select it down here. You see an icon of the car with a dotted line there saying, our maximum Wade height is 800 millimeters. But if I raise the suspension to off-road height, yes, that goes up to 900 millimeters. Speaking of ground clearance, in its highest off-road setting, the Defender suspension lifts the underfloor 291 millimetres from the ground, which just so happens to be the exact height of a wine bottle stood in its end. So in theory, we should just drive over it. Let's give it a go, shall we? It works! Oh. All right, back to the wading. Now, when I'm in the water, there should be a blue line that comes up on the screen here showing how deep you are in. The thing is, it only works below 10 kilometers an hour, and the riverbed that we're trying to cross is just so sticky, so boggy, the mud is so deep, that the only way to get across is to absolutely send it. Keep your foot in, can't see a thing. Can't see a thing. <laughs> Woo! And on that joyous note, we home in on the end of our expedition. Three days of relentless abuse and not a single thing has broken or gone wrong. We didn't even get a flat. I mean, that's just remarkable. There's a concern that the Defender 110 is just gonna steal or cannibalize sales off the Discovery. And I'm certain that it will. It's newer, it's cooler, you're gonna want one more. I want one more. But I don't think the Discovery needs to worry too much just yet. There's still plenty of room for a luxurious seven-seater SUV in Land Rover's lineup. The luxury that this car brings is what it can do. 
the places that it opens up. I said at the start of the film that off-roading wasn't really my thing, and I'm not afraid to admit it, this car, this landscape has converted me. For now, you can keep your racetracks with your noise limits and your crash barriers, because in this thing, I've got the whole world to play in.